meeting is being recorded. Welcome everybody to a, another edition of Ask the Leader with me, Wayne Fitzgerald, here at the City Council today. A uh, little later than uh, normal because um, if I start to, uh, my mouth starts to dribble, I've had some surgery uh, on my gum, so I'm struggling a bit, a bit swollen and bruised, but we'll crack on. Hopefully I won't make too much of a mess and we can get through all the questions today. Uh, joining me today is John Baker from our communications team. Uh, here and uh, we've nobody online uh, this afternoon when we're recording this uh, but John is going to ask some questions that have been sent in and John do you want to take the first one? Uh, yes I absolutely can so our first question is from Peterborough Cycle Forum and that is in, in recent days you've said you won't support low traffic neighbourhoods and by definition a low traffic neighbourhood is a scheme where motor vehicle traffic in residential streets is greatly reduced this is done by minimising the amount of traffic that comes from vehicles using the streets to get to another destination. This is often referred to as through traffic or rat running. Private motorised vehicles still have easy access to all homes and businesses without driving directly through the neighbourhood. This opens up networks of streets so people can safely travel through the area on foot, bicycle, by wheeling or by bus. So. Can you please explain why you don't support implementing low traffic neighbourhoods in Peterborough, please? OK, well, it's like all these things, they're a short or easy answer. In effect, we already have low traffic neighbourhoods, the way that the city was designed in the first place with um, all the little townships around the area, that many places um, have shops and other facilities close by uh, to make them in easy access you know, for, for everybody without using a car with good, good bus support also, particularly in the Orton's and Breton and everywhere else where they're all, all designed. So you have everything on hand, libraries, doctors, all those kind of things. So in effect, we already have it. But what it's morphed into or people have tried to hijack low traffic neighbourhoods is about freedom of movement, telling you when you can go and how you can go. That's what I'm not for. So I don't want to give ordinary people any hindrance in terms of the how they go about their daily lives if they want to use their car then they should be free to do so if they want to go to other parts of the city as many times as they want to then they should be free to do so and of course i'm trying to encourage active travel which includes more walking and cycling as i know you'll be very, very pleased about but for some people they just don't want to do that so i have to take account of a range of personal interests from car users, from cycle uh, cyclists, from people who walk, uh, people who use bikes in terms of whether they be push bike or motorized. So the fact is, I'm not for the extreme elements of low traffic neighborhoods, uh, sometimes called 15 minute cities or 20 minute cities. But yes, we must do all we can to discourage people from polluting the atmosphere with cars and fumes and everything else. But if you're using an electric car, you know, it, it, it's that's what most people are switching to nowadays. I want to give people maximum flexibility. And if you want to cycle, cycle. If you don't, take the bus or take your car. Uh, let's keep it kind of, you know, people have a right to choose how they travel in and around the city. And that's all I'm trying to protect. So that's my answer on that, John. Always happy to hear a range of views, though from anybody and just by way of a reminder because we're, we're into the first session here uh, we haven't done one for a little while uh, for the elections of course it is ask the leader it's your chance to ask me anything you want to do and all you have to do is drop us an email at ask the leader at peterborough.gov.uk john who's next okay uh this is a peterborough resident who said in this day and age having toilets with a free disabled radar key entry and a 50 pence charge paid by coin or cards swiped by the able-bodied general public to pay towards the upkeep uh, staffing and cleaning costs would be very acceptable to all can we consider this for peterborough i look i know it's a big bugbear for many people it's a bugbear of mine particularly in the city center that uh, there is a lack of public toilets uh, that is clear to see. I'm not going to deny that. And we're trying our very best to try and find locations, particularly with changing places, toilets, those that are specifically adapted for people living with a disability or caring for somebody who's disabled. Um, and I know, for example, uh, one of my officers told me that there is a changing places toilet, for example, going into Neen Park, which we helped uh, facilitate that 
with grant funding. The council has also been looking at St. Peter's Arcade, a stone's throw from where we are now, but this is not a consideration uh, due to the antisocial behaviour there and the rough sleeping that's taking place in that area. It's also in very close proximity uh, to the existing toilets in the car haven, which has male and female facilities, uh, disabled and changing places toilets already. So that's a bit close. So trying to find an ideal location is a, is a big problem in the city. But we have been in touch with a, a company that do pod type uh, uh, changing places toilets. Um, and we are investigating whether that option can go ahead. The team here have done a report on the current provision and the funding gap we have. So hopefully we'll be able to report some good news. But it is slow progress. It's so frustrating because I share those same concerns. Uh, you know, particularly if you have a medical condition as well that requires the use of a, a toilet uh, frequently. But to be fair, retailers in the city of Well have been stepping up and allowing, you know, um, customers, people, you know, just ordinary people uh, uh, that go about their daily business, whether it's shopping or whatever, uh, to, uh, uh, to allow the use of those toilets, which is really, really good news. But we are trying to improve matters. I can assure you of that. John. Uh, the next question is from Jonathan Theobald. Uh, he said, fly tipping and littering are a drain on the council's resources and make parts of Peterborough resemble a third world slum. Yet I visited many other British cities that aren't nearly as badly affected. What lessons does the leader think Peterborough can learn from more successful local authorities that could help reduce the problems faced in this city? Well, it's a constant bugbear, this one as well, fly tipping. I mean, I'd start off by reminding people what I always remind them. It is not the council, councillors, and most people that fly tip or litter. It's your friends, your neighbours, your family. They are the people. And it's also people with no regard for public realm or, you know, they don't care about the environment uh, around them. But we are working hard to catch fly tippers. And when we do catch them, we endeavour to prosecute them. But I think I've said before, on average, it might cost us £2,000 to take somebody to court. And at the moment, we get £400 back. So you can see the dilemma. There needs to be a change in the law. And I know Paul Bristow, our MP, and Shailish Vara are aware as well. And they need to be pressing for legislation to be changed to make these fines tougher. But thanks for your suggestion. And we're already working hard to, to address it, as I said. Um, we employ a team of four specialist officers also just so you know whose role is to investigate complaints and bring offenders to justice and we recently purchased a number of surveillance cameras as well that are being used to deter offenses at particular hotspots and covertly support our prosecution activity but i've just explained about the prosecution it's very very difficult and a balance has to be struck we're also in the process of recruiting specialist education officers as part of our new waste education team whose task will be to work uh, with uh, all those on the ground and communities and organizations to prevent fly tipping to employ an additional officer and equipment with a vehicle and associated costs it's about thirty five thousand pounds so it wouldn't cover it basically it's been said also that Historically, fly tipping has been a problem in Peterborough because of the type of area within the council boundary. We're a medium sized rural city with close access to isolated countryside locations, which could mean there is a greater chance of it happening here in councils more than in, in those areas rather than in more built up urban areas. As ever, though, fly tipping is a key council aim that we are looking to stop it altogether and something that we feel strongly about. As well as it being illegal, it makes our city look ugly and run down. I, we agree. It has wider economic, social and environmental health impacts too. And of course, fly tipping is, of course, again, not caused by the council. It's caused by people. If we find fly tipping on public land or the highway, we will investigate and arrange for the waste to be cleared once reported to us. Um, that means there is a, a greater chance of it happening uh, uh, wherever and at any time of day or night. But Aragon will arrange for it to be cleared straight away, certainly within 48 hours when it's classed as hazardous at 24. But we can't remove waste that is on privately owned land. That's something else from there. That's the landowner's responsibility. Anyone, though, that sees or reports fly ticking, 
fly tipping should do so uh, on 747474. That's a Peterborough number. So fly tipping, constant bugbear. We're not going to eradicate it. We just need to try and keep on top of it. And if anybody's got any solutions or suggestions, always happy to hear them. I can see that my uh, my face is still swollen, dribbling a bit. For those that missed the start, uh, I am suffering a little bit today uh, with some surgery. So uh, if I'm uh, uh, making some strange noises, please forgive me. But you are uh, watching uh, Ask the Leader from Peterborough City Council. And uh, it's me, Wayne Fitzgerald. And all you need to do to get in touch is email us, asktheleader at peterborough.gov.uk. With me today is uh, John Baker from our communications team. And no doubt he'll now give me another question. I shall do, yes. Um, there's a comment from a Peterborough resident um, who asked if the money that we spend on the fountains might be better spent on an eco shop or cafe, which could employ people with special needs. I think, you know, uh, there are all sorts of suggestions for all sorts of things all of the time. And we have to make a, a judgment and a balance uh, within all these things. But we already do a lot for people uh, in the disabled world in terms of employment. Only look at Westcombe for a start, which has been a long running uh, council project, which uh, uh, makes sure that people living with disabilities and have that uh, uh, unfortunate you know, background of of there are all types of disabilities people have some physical some you can't see i have personal experience myself in my own family so the council do do a lot for those um working uh, uh giving opportunities that, to those uh, for work within the disabled uh, uh family and you know the fountains um what we decided to do so far, by the way, just to recap is, yeah, I asked the public what they thought. and It was very useful to do so because I like to try and engage with as many people as I can and the council can, just like these. This is what these are uh, um, sessions are for. So um, we need to understand the condition of those fountains before we make a final decision. They're great when they're off. You know, they're fantastic. Uh, and I know... You know, it was a 60 40 poll, but um, overall, even the traders in the city, by the way, thought they should be on that, perhaps didn't come out in the poll. So I can't see that we would benefit from an eco shop cafe because there are all sorts of places in Ravenstalk. There's a in uh, uh, in the center there, there is a, a cafe there that, that also employs uh, people with a disability. So there are lots of opportunities within the city uh, for employment. So uh, I will mention it certainly to colleagues who might look after the city centre and see what they say. But at the moment, um, I'm not sure that we um, know what we're doing or what budget we have going forward for anything. But as soon as we do, I shall let you know on that. John. Uh, I, I suppose in a similar note, uh, our next question was from David Wood, who suggested, I think you could invest in a light feature to bring Cathedral Square to life at night. This would be low maintenance and yet give the centre of the city some vitality rather than a very bland and boring concrete walkway. Now, the irony is here, I saw two photographs recently, one from 1910 and one from 1920. And I shared it amongst colleagues and thanks to Graham Walker for giving it to me or sending me a link. Guess what? Market Square, now Cathedral Square, square was completely paved over and there were no trees or anything else so it's not a new thing to have the square paved over and the reason why it was done like that because it remains flexible space so that when there are events on there are no fountains and people can move on to the square and with vehicles and displays and everything else so that's why we have it like that and as for a light show i mean i spend a lot of time in the city center in the evening it's fantastic. When the fountains were on, there were multicolored lights. You set against a backdrop of the cathedral, which is fantastic in the evening and the churches and all the other public realm all lit up. So I don't disagree, but I would say there is enough light and um, uh, in terms of displays, and particularly if the fountains were on. But we're looking at all options, as I said, for what we do with Cathedral Square. But one thing is for sure, it needs to remain flexible space. Otherwise, we couldn't put on the events and uh, the markets and all the other things that we do. Hence, it was designed in such a way. But like everything else, you know, it's been down 13, 14 years and we need to uh, invest money in it, whether that's with the fountains or not with them. So we are looking at a range of options on how we can improve Cathedral Square 
And again, that's being worked on as we speak. So more details on that will either come out through uh, the council on here or in the press, I'm sure. Thanks, John. OK, next one is from the chief reporter at the Peterborough Telegraph, Stephen Briggs. Ooh. Uh, he said, um, I'm sure you heard Councillor Stevenson, Julie Stevenson, on the radio today or have seen her comments talking about the hydrotherapy pool, asking why the cash guzzling Lido is deemed a safety cow, but the hydro pool is not with both not being statutory services. Now the Lyme Academy Hydro trial is ending. I was hoping to get a response from yourself on this. And what your message to hydro pool users in Peterborough is now that the trial at Lyme Academy has finished. Well, we're topical, certainly. This question only came in today, the morning of recording. So, uh, Stephen, I'm sure you'll be able to play this back or uh, be online quite soon after we finish the recording today. Um, Coincidentally, I did hear uh, um, a, a clip of that being played. I didn't hear the whole thing, but, you know, Julie Stevenson is entitled to her view, but I think she would find if she put that view to the electorate and she stood on a platform of closed the Lido, I don't think she'd be a councillor for very long. The two things are completely different. Look, hydrotherapy, and I have a great deal of sympathy for those that perhaps are in need of that service, is not something the council provides. As I've said over and over again, they should lobby, users should lobby the health service via their MPs or directly because it is a health provision. It's not something that the council do. We don't provide NHS services. So for in Cambridge, for example, I think the NHS do provide hydrotherapy, but they don't commission it here. The second thing is that, you know, there are 15,000 plus people, uh, I'm told, have already enjoyed and use the Lido so far it's not been open that long and the difference is you may say it's not a statutory service or fine there are lots of things that aren't you know museums aren't and you know putting the art in those and we could sell it all but let me tell you the Lido is a listed building that we have a duty of care to to uphold and keep in good order so that's the reason why the Lido will exist because we would be forced to maintain and keep it in good order if not. It's also a vital leisure uh, uh, provision within the city, as evidenced by the numbers. It's much loved. And the slightest mention of closing it, uh, in my experience, has generally caused uproar. But if some other councillors want to suggest that, that's fine. But again, I'll reiterate, we don't provide hydrotherapy services. What we are trying to do is encourage the private sector as has already been well documented, to provide these services. And if they see that there is a need for them and that they can at least, you know, uh, break even, uh, because a lot of people doing this, you know, uh, I know the, the one that Dr. Moda is particularly um, uh, trying to uh, get going, uh, which we, we has been well publicised. I think that's because of personal experience with his own family. Um, and so there is empathy there. So everybody's trying to do it for the right reasons. And, you know, but at the end of the day, this is a medical matter, not a council matter. So we would encourage uh, all people who are in need of that service to lobby the NHS to commission it in Peterborough. John. OK, this is the final one. This is another one uh, related to a councillor. Uh, councillor Ishmael Hussain says, um, Dear Wayne, during your next Ask the Leader session, can you please clarify for members of the public the reason I called in the original planning committee decision on the Horsey Toll application and whether I was justified to do so, considering the outcome of Tuesday's planning committee meeting. Oh, yes, there's been a lot of uh, um, media speculation and interest in the story for a number of months, but probably and I, I've said nothing. I've kept quiet about it because it frankly is not really anything to do with me, despite what people might say or think. So um, I think Councillor um Hussein is all owed an apology and probably Councillor Warren and Councillor Sharp too um for those eagle-eyed members of the public that keep an eye on these things uh some weeks ago they called in the decision of the planning committee on the basis they didn't feel it was the right decision on the day and um it didn't quite add up they couldn't work out why now their decision to call that in at the time caused some criticism from other members, particularly the chairman of the planning committee, unfairly, and perhaps he should issue an apology to them, uh, it, because he, he he said all sorts of 
things really that were quite hurtful and damaging to their reputations. But of course, they've been vindicated because what has happened since is uh, uh, just in Tuesday this week, uh, following legal advice that called into question the planning committee's original decision as being wrong, and people will try to tell you it's a different application or there's new information. No. The legal advice said that the previous application or the, the application as it was presented in March met the conditions of the local plan and the planning committee got it wrong. Uh, there was another caveat that said if the applicant appealed, he would most certainly win, which would indeed cost the council money. But that wasn't that's not the reason, as is being purported in certain quarters. Quite frankly, it was just the wrong decision. And what came to back to planning and is rather unusual at the request of the planning team to reconsider it, given the legal advice that they had that said it conformed to the local plan and the risks associated with an appeal. Bizarrely, you might say, the planning committee unanimously actually did a U-turn on their previous decision and voted for that application. You'll hear all sorts of other speculation and, you know, uh, about who was involved, who's not involved, but it just simply isn't true. It's a bang to rights application that the planning officers wholeheartedly supported 100%. And the planning committee on the first occasion, as I said, did get it wrong. Uh, certain members won't agree with that, but that's up to them. But I'm telling you the truth. And the second uh, time it came back to the hearing, it now has gone through. So the members that called it in that got criticised were right to do so. As I said, they've been vindicated and they're, they're owed an apology. Um, and I'm glad that natural justice prevailed, if you want to call it that. Um, and I hope the matter is now behind us and we, we can move on and get on with the growth and development of the city to support our services. And again, I'll say quite clearly, it's got to be the right kind of growth and not growth at any cost. So, John, I think that's all I want to say on that, really. I hope that's clarified the matter for some people. Um, but as ever, if you have any questions that you want to ask me, uh, or I can get some help from and support from officers, all you need to do is just email me. It's askthelieder at peterborough.gov.uk. And you can get yourself on here, or indeed uh, uh, John or another member of the team will put your questions uh, to me so that we can... Um, uh, basically let you know what we think and what other people think whatever it is we're always here to answer your questions but for now i think we're done so i'll bid you uh, a very good day good evening whatever time you're watching this uh, until the next time uh, when we do ask the leader thanks <laughs>